Hello and welcome. It is hard to believe, but one year passed since the last month of Septandi, and I welcome you to the Septandi 2021 special on my channel. If you don't know what I mean, Septandi is a happy month where many tinkerers around the world talk about their Tandy computers, repair them, do upgrades whatsoever. And this year I would like to use the opportunity and make some changes to my beloved Tandy 1000 RSX, which I presented last year in details. If you missed that, it is probably worth it to take a look at four parts video I made in September 2020. In the past year I used this computer from time to time and played with various sound cards. When you remember, I wanted to use this Creative Sound Blaster 2.0 sound card back then. First of all, because of the outstanding compatibility, but also because of period authenticity. However, that didn't work very well. First of all, this card is very noisy. And by that, I don't even mean the static noise by an amplifier, for example, but more the noise which bleeds through the data bus. Just listen to the following example. I hope you can hear what I mean. Every activity on the data bus bleeds through the sound card into the output and makes it a very unpleasant experience, especially when using headphones. These can have many reasons, but the main one is usually a bad mainboard and sound card quality. This can be worked around, for example, by using a better shielded sound card with a better PCB layout. But quality was not my single concern. After testing multiple cards and different settings, I ran into sporadic system lockups quite often. This 10D hung so hard that it didn't even react to Ctrl Alt Delete key combination, and since it doesn't have any reset button, I had to turn off and then back on the machine. Unfortunately, this didn't always work flawlessly, and the hard drive didn't spin up properly if I turned the machine on too fast. So I had to wait for at least 10 seconds before turning it back on again. That was quite annoying. And the first thing I would like to talk about today is a proper reset button. On the main board near the battery there is an unpopulated reset header and a capacitor. The last one is actually totally optional, but it is good for stability and helps to avoid any shaky contact when the reset button gets pressed. I just took a 1 microfarad capacitor which I had at hand and which was just small enough to fit on the pads. The missing header, where the reset button can be connected, was also added in a second. With a button, a pair of DuPont clamps and a piece of wire cut down to the needed length, the reset button was ready to be mounted onto the case. I didn't want to drill the front or any plastic parts. I just find the case of this tandy too nice to damage it like that. So I decided to hide the reset button on the back. There was some open space near the VGA output where the reset button would fit just perfectly. I was thinking a couple of times if I want to drill a hole into the case, theoretically I'd be able to mount the reset button on the slot bracket of one isocard, but then what if I want to switch the cards? This happens quite often when I play around with different hardware and then I'd have to replace the reset button every time. So long story short, I decided that the metal near the VGA port on the case would be the best place to go. After all, I already modified the PSU heavily and drilled holes for the fans previously. So another tiny hole will not hurt and since it is metal, I can still cover it easily in the future if I need to. And this is how it looks like internally. Now it should be possible to reset the system easily without the need to turn it off and on with an annoying pause in between. 
That's quite useful, but a reset button is not a proper solution to the actual problem which I mentioned. Where did the system lockups come from? What was the reason for that? As I was trying to use the Sound Blaster 2.0 sound card, I noticed that if the card was installed in the system, then I couldn't use Tandy sound system at all. There was either no sound or the system froze. After a while and some experiments, I also realized that if I tried to start a game with Sound Blaster usage, after I tried to run something with Tandy sound, the computer usually also froze as soon as it was trying to play digital sound. And after a short investigation, it turned out that the Tandy digital to analog converter, which is responsible for the digital sound effects, is hardwired to DMA1, which was also used on the early Sound Blaster sound cards like the Sound Blaster 2.0. Later Sound Blaster and compatible models made the DMA address selectable, but that was not the case for this card. Furthermore, most of the games which would run on this 10D1000 RS6 are from the time where DMA1 was assumed standard and the games didn't allow to change it. So we have games which did expect a deck at DMA1 and two devices, 10D and Sound Blaster, which both did provide a deck on DMA1, a classic DMA conflict. Using another DMA address is not possible, so it would be nice if it would be possible to activate the required sound device only if needed. Well, it turned out that the Tandy sound system on this machine is only activated on the first access. Otherwise, it doesn't turn on and produces no DMA conflict with the sound blaster. So, as long as you don't use Tandy sound, you are good to go with this creative card. But what if you want to use Tandy Sound for some reason? Well, the problem is that the Sound Blaster 2.0 is always active. It is controlled by the jumpers and doesn't need any drivers. So you can't deactivate this card if you want to avoid a DMA conflict. So the only way to use Tandy Sound system is to remove the Sound Blaster card physically from the computer. That is really annoying and is not a plausible solution at all. So, end of the story, a Sound Blaster 2.0 is not a good sound card for this machine. First of all, it is too noisy in this mainboard, and second, it doesn't allow to use Tandy sound in parallel. Instead, I need a sound card which has to be activated per software. This way, I would be able to leave it deactivated as long as I want to use the onboard Tandy sound system and initialize the sound card only if I want to play the game with a Sound Blaster compatibility. One of the sound cards I tested was this Opti sound card, which is already a good fit, but I have to admit that I have a quite big collection of sound cards, which I'm proud of. Here is for example the TerraTag sound card, which I resurrected in one of my previous videos. By the way, in a comment to that video, I was asked how I store my hardware. Well, this is how I do it. I try to pack every card in an anti-static bag and put them in a box. As you see, I already possess quite a lot of sound cards, and I will not talk about all of them today. But if you are interested in some sort of sound card special, please write into the comments what exactly you would like to see. As I said, this Creative Sound Blaster 2.0 is not a good choice for the 10 d 1000 RSX, so I was searching for something what is not too new, or at least something what is cool enough to take a place in this machine. Another period correct card would be the Sound Blaster Pro 1.0, also a really cool sound card, but basically it is the Sound Blaster 2.0 but with stereo capabilities. It is built up from the same components, but they were just doubled, so it has two OPL2 synthesizers, two DSPs and so on. The important thing is that this sound card has the same jumpers and no way to activate or deactivate the card per software. So, although it is... Um, well, quite cool, it is as bad choice as the Sound Blaster 2.0. Here I have an early version of a Sound Blaster 16, which is also completely jumper configured, without a way to deactivate it per software, so obviously this wouldn't be a good choice either. And this sound card would be a nice choice. It is completely Sound Blaster Pro compatible, it has genuine OPL3 FM from Yamaha, and this card has to be initialized per software. However, it is also not as quite silent as I would like it to be. Furthermore, this sound card is from 1995, and 
Although it is feature-wise really good, still it is maybe too new and is nothing really special. But maybe you remember the pile of hardware which I presented a couple of weeks ago on my channel. Maybe you remember why I bought that hardware after all, and I'm glad to present to you the Pro Audio Spectrum 16 from MediaVision. This on card is maybe a little overkill for the 10D1000 RSX, but it has two big advantages over the other cards I showed so far. First one is maybe a little bit less important, but this card has a coolness factor which absolutely deserves to take a place in my 10D machine. And second, this card has the best quality you could find back in the days, so noise like with Sound Blaster, which I was talking about before, should be not a problem at all with this card. I think I will do a follow-up video about why this sound card is so cool. Believe me, it has an exciting and influential story. For now, all I would like to say is that this card has the same Yamaha OPL3 FM synthesizer as what Creative used on the Sound Blaster Pro 2.0 and uh, all the newer cards, but this card uh, can digital stereo sound only in games which explicitly supported Pro Audio Spectrum. It can emulate Sound Blaster, but only the non-Pro mono version. However, in this 10D1000 RSX, this shouldn't be a problem, since all the games which would be able to run with playable frame rates on this machine are from the time before stereo sound was a common thing, so mono Sound Blaster emulation would be just enough. But more important thing is that the audio quality is years ahead of any creative products from around that time. Okay, let's take a look at the software. In this video I will talk only about DOS, since I don't use any windows on my 10D1000 RSX. The installation of the Pro Audio Spectrum drivers is not a problem at all. They seem to be also quite as high quality as the hardware itself. The setup tool automatically checks for free IRQ and DMA addresses and helps to avoid conflicts already during the installation. I can imagine that such resources detection can be problematic on some systems and theoretically could freeze the machine, but I didn't observe any issues, it just worked. The installation and setup routine adds a device driver mvsound.sys to the configsys file. All the arguments behind are self-explaining, I guess, and are the same resource settings which I configured during the installation previously. As you can see, I already added a boot menu, which will load the sound card driver only if required. Now the system can be booted with or without the sound card driver. This way I can control per software if I want the sound card to be active or not and use Tandy sound system if I want without the need to pull the sound card physically from the ISA slot. And after a reboot, the Sound Blaster emulation should work for all the games as usual. Wolfenstein 3D auto detects the Sound Blaster flawlessly as you see. The sound is really clean, it has actually less noise and more depth than any other sound card I tested. There are quite a lot of things to tell about this sound card, all the advantages and disadvantages and how to solve them, but I would like to make a separate video about it, so don't miss it in the near future if you are interested. And I guess so far one thing left to test, the reset button, which I added previously. And as you see it works like charm. Well, and this were my 10D1000 RSX fixes I wanted to share with you for this September 2021. Not too much, but these fixes greatly improve the usability and fun with this machine. I hope you enjoyed it and would love to see you on my channel again. So far, thank you and goodbye.